Welcome to the Endless Knot Podcast. Where the more we know, the more we want to find out. Tracing serendipitous connections through our lives and across disciplines. Hi, I'm Avon. And I'm Mark. And today we're coming back to colors. We're going to be talking about yellow and orange on this podcast. But first, we want to say thank you to our most recent Patreon supporters, Axel, Gregory, Brandon, and Patrick. We really appreciate your support. Thank you so much for helping us out over at Patreon. Thanks, all. Your support really helps us with things that we need for doing research, with the equipment, with maintaining the website, and just making us feel like what we're doing is appreciated. And we really, really are grateful for that. It's super useful. Next, I wanted to draw your attention to another podcast. If you like this one that we do, we're sure you'll enjoy Words for Granted. So we're going to let Ray introduce himself. Hey guys, I'm Ray Belli, the host of Words for Granted, a brand new podcast that looks at how words change over time. Have you ever wondered where words come from or why they mean what they mean? Yeah? Well, me too. In fact, I think about these things all the time, and that's why I've created Words for Granted. It's kind of like an ongoing greatest hits compilation of the most fascinating word evolutions in the English language. Did you know that villain once meant farm worker, or that bead once meant prayer? The bottom line is, if you're a word nerd, let's be friends. You can find out more about the show at wordsforgranted.com and follow Words for Granted on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. I hope you tune in to the next show. Sounds great, doesn't it? Yeah, it really does. I've been enjoying Ray's episodes on individual word biographies a lot. So do check that out. And finally, before we get to our color terms, but I guess in a way connected to our color terms, we got to talk about our cocktails. Cocktails. Is there a... <laughs> there's a singular, a dual, and a plural. Is there a trial? What Mark's trying to hint at is the fact that I could not decide between two different appropriate cocktails for tonight and I've therefore made myself two drinks. <laughs> Mark thinks this is great <laughs> extravagance on my part. <laughs> He's not wrong. One of them's kind of small. The other one's kind of big. <laughs> so would you like to start with your completely moderate and reasonable drink? Sure. So mine is called an Orange Blossom. It's a classic, I think. Mm -hmm. And it's just equal parts orange juice and gin. And as we'll see, you know, as we come to it, the choice of, well, orange is obvious, but gin is also relevant too. All right. And I, as I said, was torn between two cocktails that I found when I looked up a particular ingredient. So I picked up a bottle of Galliano because I was thinking about yellow liqueurs. Yellow Chartreuse is a fairly well-known yellow liqueur, but our local liquor store didn't have it. So I got Galliano instead. And we then live I... beyond the pale. <laughs> oh, that's kind yeah, of appropriate, yeah, too. Yeah, 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 okay. Pale's going to come up, I'm telling you. <laughs> Not that kind Not of pale. Not that kind of pale, but, but it's a pun. <laughs> so I looked up Galliano, and I found two among um, several cocktails that were so odd that I needed to try them. So the first is called the Gagliardo. Not the best name. No, not a particularly exciting name. However, what it has in it is vodka, galliano, lemon juice, and rose water. In fact, it has half an ounce of rose water in it. And I I was scared, so I only put a quarter ounce of rose water because rose water is really strong. Potent stuff. So anyway, I haven't actually tried that. I will in a moment. The other cocktail I made is called a golden dream. <laughs> I know there's some topical resonances to a lot of what we're going to be talking about tonight, unfortunately. And it is also Galliano and in this case, triple sec and a little bit of orange juice and a little bit of cream. And you thought it sounded like <laughs> an orange Julius. So yeah, which is alcoholic a orange kind Julius. of ju drink. So, all right. So I'm going to try first. I'm going to try my Gagliardo because it's the less dessert E1. Do you want to try your gin blossom? I'll try my gin blossom. Yeah. Uh, orange blossom, sorry. Right. Well. Yep. Comes as expected. Right. Just basic orange juice and gin. Mm -hmm. This is really interesting. The rose water one. Galliano has a very vanilla y flavor and herby, mm -hmm. and that combines with rose water, and then the lemon juice balances it. Here, try it. 
Is there a difference between the nose and the taste is what I'm sort of... It's not as strong scented once it's mixed. No, you really get the vanilla. Yeah, in the smell. In the smell. In, in the scent, in the nose. Hmm. Not my thing, but I think, but... I, um, I can't quite tell if it's, it's my odd. thing. It's odd. I can't tell if it's my thing or not either. It's not like immediately repulsive, but it's also... I mean, I'm just not used to drinking rose water. It's unusual. Yeah. And so I'm going to have to just going to have to drink it and see if I like it by the end of it. Mm. <laughs> All right. I'm going to take a sip of the other one, though. I'm going to leave it for later. That tastes like an orange Julius. <laughs> oh, totally. I like that. It's uh, it's like a dessert in a glass. Yeah. Yeah. It's an orange Julius with alcohol. Mm -hmm. mm. It's got that because it's got that vanilla flavor, which an orange Julius. I don't know if everybody in the world knows what an orange Julius is. I don't know how widespread that thing is. I think it's at least American. It's orange juice. And ice and ice creamy flavor. It's like got a vanilla y thing in it that I don't like. And milk. Right? Milk. Yeah, they're milk solids milk in it. It's a and milk or cream or sort something. Sort of like yeah. an orange milkshake, but it's a very. And an egg. That's right. There's it has egg an egg in it. In it. Yeah. yeah. It's a very particular thing. So write in and tell us if Orange Julius is a thing in your part of the world. <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd be, be curious. curious to know. They were definitely a thing in malls when I was growing up. And they're still available, mostly in combination with Dairy Queen ah. now. Anyway, it's tasty. Okay, I'll get to that after I finish my odd rosewater one. All right, well, moving on from cocktails then, let us turn to the actual substance. So if you're catching up with us and haven't listened to some of our earlier podcasts, we've been doing an intermittent series on colors, on color terms, the origins of the color words in English, as well as some of the color terms in Latin and Greek and some of the historical connotations and symbolisms of those colors in classical, medieval, and contemporary European thought. So having worked our way through a number of the colors, we're coming towards the end. We've probably got this one and maybe two more episodes, I would suspect. So today we're doing yellow and orange, which are obviously related colors. And as we, I think we're both see as we go through our material are colors that are very, very hard to distinguish, in fact, in historical terms. So I thought I would start by doing a very quick rundown of terms for yellow in Greek and Latin. And I can do a quick rundown because essentially there aren't any, <laughs> or there are very few, there are not none, but there are very few. In Greek, really the only term that absolutely means yellow in a sort of primary color term way is xanthos. And it means yellow. Dictionary definition is yellow of various shades, frequently with a tinge of red, brown, or auburn. And in epics, so in the earliest uses, in particular in Homer, mostly used of fair or golden hair. So xanthos is used almost exclusively in our earliest sources of hair. So really it means blonde. Blonde, right. Now, as our sources continue, once you get into the fifth century and beyond, it's used of things that are just chromatically yellow. So it definitely gets the sense of, if it doesn't start with the sense of, yellow. And that is really the only Greek term that I would say is sort of basic color term yellow. Now there's one other that also comes into Latin, and which is crocaeus, and that just is crocus colored. Right. But it's not exactly crocus colored. What it is is saffron, because crocus colors refers to the color produced as a dye from the stamens of the crocus flower. And if you've ever cooked with saffron in now, you will know that it dyes things a bright yellow or even orange, but we'll come back to that, color. So crocaeus just means saffron colored, but it does get used therefore to describe things that are dyed what we would call yellow. And it's important just because it because it's connected to a thing that dyes stuff a certain color, we can be certain what color it's referring to. Right. So unlike xanthos, which we have to assume from certain contexts what it col what the actual chromatic value is. We've talked on this podcast before about the difficulty, especially with Greek early Greek sources, of assigning an actual sort of wavelength of light to terms. You can talk about terms as being color terms, but do they mean shining? Do they mean, are they referring actually to a particular chromatic sense or do they mean something else? Well, with crocaeus, we know what it is referring to. And the, the only other color is chloros, which I talked about when we talked about green and blue. Right. Because it means green mostly, but it can mean greenish yellow or pale green because it can mean that sort of very new plant color. Right. 
which is close to yellow. So it's a word that can overlap with yellow. So those are the three Greek words. Latin has crocaeus again, mm -hmm. just taken straight, taken from, straight from Greek, Greek. Yep. meaning of saffron, saffron colored, yellow. It has a color fulvus, which is basically brown, but as our dictionary says, apparently ranging between a dull yellow and a reddish brown. It's often used to describe sand okay. or lions. Right. So that sounds if sand yellow. or lion is yellow in your eyes, then mm -hmm. fulvus can mean yellow. Mm -hmm. There's luteus, which is one of these words like crocaeus that comes from something that produces a dye. So mm -hmm. there's a plant, a lutum. It's a plant that yields, all we know about it essentially is it's a plant that yields a yellow dye. <laughs> it's a bit circular here, but anyway, so luteus means yellow. And actually that's probably the primary fully chromatic yellow word in Latin. So if you just want to say yellow, yellow with, plain yellow, with right. really few connotations other than just chromatic, you'd say luteus. Right. Then there's glaucus, which is gray green. I talked about that when we talked about green as well. And again, the color of vegetation. So a plant color that can kind of lean towards yellow. And then flavus, flavus is the other main color word for yellow. Hmm. And flavus is the word that most often translates or is used in the same way as xanthus is. So it means yellow, especially pale yellow or golden, but it also means having the hair or beard yellow, so fair-haired or blonde. So it's like xanthus, okay. golden hair. Yeah. Now, flowers is one of the terms that when, I, I've mentioned this author before, Mark Bradley, who wrote the book, hmm. uh, a book about color terms in Latin, and I've referred to him a lot because he's done very interesting work on it. He opens his book, his introduction opens with a discussion of the problem of translating flavus. Right. And he says it's traditionally described as yellow, but it is used in a number of places where yellow seems a really weird description. For instance, describing the lovely face of a young, desirable boy, like a sexually attractive young adolescent mm. boy. Mm. And that seems odd. So in 1950, an author named Lawton said that Flavus actually meant blonde, primarily, like as a first okay. meaning. And then when it was referring to face, it was referring to the blonde fluff, essentially, of an, a pre-adolescent or adolescent boy, that first beard mm -hmm. that's coming in. Mm -hmm. And so it's not referring to the complexion or to the skin. It's referring to the beard, the beard even right. though the word for hair is or beard isn't mentioned. Mm. Bradley agrees with that, but moves past it to say that it's... So he, he what he wants to argue is right now the dictionary says, and I, I we talked about this a bit with weariness, mm. Right now, the dictionary says that its primary meaning is yellow, and its secondary meaning is blonde. Bradley wants that switched. He says the primary meaning is blonde. It refers to blonde hair. Okay. But it also certainly can have a purely chromatic sense. It can be divorced from that context, mm -hmm. and so it can develop a pure, purely chromatic sense. It can be used of other objects to just mean yellow, mm -hmm. but always with that primary sense of blonde referring to hair. Now, I have a question do the Romans have any sense of redhead, which obviously isn't actually red, but orange? Yes, they do. And I think we and we may have covered this under red. Rufus is the word most often used for red-haired. Okay. So they do have a separate word for red-haired. So this is not referring there. So it doesn't to... seem to be referring. To, now, in the Greek, it may be. Xanthus may be. It's, it's a little right. harder to tell there. But the Romans, at least from the Middle Republic onward, have interacted with enough people with red hair and blonde hair. Right. So they talk about the Gauls as having red hair, Rufus hair, right. and the Germans as having flowers, ah, blonde okay. hair. So there is a distinction. There is a distinction. Yeah, there, there is a okay. distinction. And actually, that's sort of what I was about to come to, that when hair is described as flowers in, so when it's xanthus in Greek, I said that that was in, in the epic, it always meant blonde. Yeah. It's used almost exclusively or possibly exclusively in Homer to be referring to either gods, goddesses, or heroes. Oh. So it's divinities who are xanthus, who are blonde. Hmm. So you can, um, you know, this is the question, do we mean a natural chromatic tinge or do we mean something else? Hmm. Does it mean blonde or does it mean shining? Is the mm -hmm. idea that there's some sort of divine beauty to it? Right. Because, of course, you know, you come back to Greeks. How blonde were any Greeks? Mm -hmm. You know, in in a Germanic sense of blonde, for instance. Not right. very. 
Now, maybe that's all that it was. Maybe the idea was that the divinities were sort of exceptional. But it may also not really mean blonde the way we mean sort of straw-colored blonde hair, but some other connotation of shining and gleaming or something. But it's very hard to unpick that because by the later periods, it becomes very clear that it's blonde because they've met lots of blonde peoples and they can actually distinguish them as blonde. Mm -hmm. But in Homer, it's divinities who are blonde. And that does carry over into Latin. So you get divinities as flowers in Latin. Right. So that's particularly where blonde hair is used. But it also can be, as we said, the downy beard of an adolescent. There, of course, it is connoting attractiveness, though, and sexual attractiveness. So it's not just purely descriptive. It's meaning that they're desirable. So that, you know, that overlaps with the divine meaning. Because, of course, when it describes a divinity, it's describing them as beautiful. But it can also mean foreignness. Because certainly by the historical period, we have... The idea that Flowis is blonde hair is barbarian, German in particular. Right. And therefore, often slaves have blonde hair. Right. Because lots of slaves were barbarian and German. But it also seems to have been fairly attractive because there's definitely some poems and other mention of women buying barbarian hair to make wigs. Right. The Roman women often wore wigs and so blonde hair as a wig. But you can imagine, understand that because even if it may have meant barbarian, it was also associated with divinities mm -hmm. and beauty. So you can see that overlapping. I, I remember as an undergrad, there was a classmate who was blonde and Italian and was very proud to tell us that in Italy, blonde hair is considered very attractive. Yes, because so it's unusual. It's unusual, yeah. Mm -hmm. So Flavus is also a, a name that gets given to slaves because the Romans were highly unoriginal with their slave naming. <laughs> and they often tended to name them, you know, after the place they were from or the color of their hair. Or the only originality Romans ever showed with slaves was naming them divine names that were highly ironic. Ironic, right. So, yeah, that was about as good as they ever got. And gold is often flavus. But if you think about it as being divine and shining and beautiful, that also is not surprising. Right. So that's pretty much all I have to say about yellow. Now, I will say, and we can come back to this, that there are Roman writers who write about technicalities of color from a number of perspectives, mm. on it. some from painting and art perspectives, some from scientific perspectives, trying to explain how colors work or perception works. And several of those authors list all of these colors that I've mentioned as categories of ruber or rufus, that is of red. So all of these names for yellow are listed by Roman writers as subcategories of red. So just to point out that what we're distinguishing as a as a separate primary color right. is not necessarily at all considered. It's one of the things along the spectrum of red, right? at least to those technical writers on, on color. And that includes gold. Okay. Gold and yellow are definitely on all parts of the red spectrum right. for them. So what, where do you want to go from there? Well, I mean, so this sort of makes sense, just to sort of remind us all in terms of the Berlin and K system of color term development, which mm -hmm. we've talked about before. So you start with white and black, then red. Cultures have. Cultures have. Stuff, yeah. yeah. So cultures will develop at least white and black. Mm -hmm. And then if they develop more color terms, the next one will be red. After that, green and yellow come together. Right. So this overlap that you're suggesting in Greek between green, green and, and yellow, yellow makes yeah. sense. Mm -hmm. Then blue, then brown, and later on things like orange and purple and so forth. Right. So that makes sense. Yeah. And it makes sense that yellow would be considered a subset of red in the sense that red is a more primary color division than yellow. So as cultures move out. Right. So, I mean, let's start with the word yellow itself. I mean, it goes back to a Proto-Indo-European root that I've mentioned in one of the videos, if not, I don't think it's come up in, in one of our color podcasts before. Okay. But it's the same root that gives us gold. Oh, okay. Yes. Yes. You've so, told. Okay. gel. So, this, this root gel gives us yellow. It also gives us yolk, which basically just means yellow thing. It gives us glass, which... Um, I find interesting because glass tends to have a sort of greenish color in early, you know, crude glass, doesn't it? I guess, yeah. 
I'm never sure because glass, as it gets as it ages, change colors. Mm. So I'm never sure how much they look like that or not. But yeah, mm. I mean, maybe a yellowish green color. Right. I should say that the root gel means shining. It's one of these... Um, one of the 75 words yeah, in Indo-European in that, Indo means that means shining, shining. With various derivatives referring to color, bright materials, gold, and so forth. Right. Unsurprisingly, it also gives us the word gall. So yellow bile. The gall is in the gallbladder. Right. So think bile, yellow bile. Right. right. You know, so that's a physical thing, a physical color that we know the distinct color of. It's common to all human beings. Right. We can get a pretty clear idea that from early on, this word referred to that color. Right. And that in Greek is the choler. Choler. Yeah. Which is from that chloros root. And from that, therefore, from that choler root, then we obviously get melancholy, yeah. which is black bile, which I think is interesting because it's a double color word. The mela part, melon black, part, means yeah. black, or so dark, yeah. dark. So black bile, it's mm -hmm. the black bile. Right, right. But it literally means black, black yellow. yellow. <laughs> <laughs> Jaundice mm -hmm. and jaune. Jaune. Yeah. Jaune in French also comes from this root. Mm -hmm. uh, so yellow coloring um, right. caused by the bile itself. Gold, as I said, itself comes from the same root. Now, you mentioned a number of yellow Latin words mm -hmm. that I want to sort of come back to. So flavus is one. Yeah. And that actually comes from a root that we have mentioned in our color podcasts before. Mm -hmm. It comes from the bell, which right. means it's another shining <laughs> root, which gives us a bunch of color terms. So they all come from the idea of shining. It probably has more to do with the matte, shiny contrast. Contrast rather than a particular hue. Right. But from this root, we not only get flavus, but also black and blue <laughs> and bleach <laughs> and bleak. And we get flavus and fulvus is the other related Latin word that comes from the same root, unsurprisingly, both referring to pretty similar colors yeah, and gas. Yeah, fairly, a reasonably similar range, yeah. Mm -hmm. One thing that I was, in, just in terms of, of Latin terms that I was interested in, is this yellow root, gel, mm -hmm. also gives us helvus. Do you know anything about this this term? Helvus? Helvus. Dull yellow is how I've seen it glossed. Oh, give me a dictionary. Let's quickly look this one up. <laughs> I haven't seen it, I will no. say. Okay. I don't know the... This root, by the way, as I say, gives us yellow. The old English form of the word yellow is pretty similar. It's yolu. So it seems to be a pretty straight line development from old English to to modern English, referring basically to the same color. Right. So helvus here, dull yellow, done. And the only quotation they give in the Oxford Latin Dictionary anyway is from Vero. Then they mention Colin, Mella, and Paulus. The Vero is referring to cows, boes, colore, potissimum, nigro de inde robeo tertio helvo quarto albo. So cows that are black, then reddish, and a third part yellow and a fourth part white. So talking about different colors of cow. So if it's a yellow cow, mm, I think that mm -hmm, gives you a mm -hmm. sense of what that color might be. So yes, it seems to turn up in very prosaic contexts, okay. very technical contexts, technical context. which is probably why I don't know it because I ignore such contexts <laughs> <laughs> whenever possible. So that was that was one that I just had a, you know no idea about because I hadn't no, heard of it either, no, but uh, it comes up as a cognate. So. Well, in terms of other words for yellow, then, some of them, unsurprisingly, refer to a physical thing, right, right. that has that color. So amber right. is a sort of yellow range color. And the word amber itself is quite interesting. It comes from anbar, from Arabic, but ultimately from Persian. So Persian, Arabic, and then mm -hmm. into French and then into English. This is the, the, the interesting thing. The, the word for a while referred to two different substances okay. called amber. One was the, the sort of resin that we know of the tree, mm -hmm. what we now think of as amber. Fossilized amber. Fossilized yeah. amber. But it also refers to ambergris. Right. The whale vomit. Whale, yeah, stomach goo or whatever it is. Whale vomit. Whale vomit, which is commonly used as an ingredient for perfumes. Mm -hmm. The commonly might be the wrong word because it's an extremely rare, rare substance. Rare thing, yeah. substance, yes. Hard yeah. to collect. If you want to know more about ambergris, listen to the gastropod episode on ice cream. <laughs> and 
That sounds very strange, but the Gastropod Podcast, a podcast about the history and science of food, has an episode about ice cream, and they talk about making ambergris ice cream, and they describe what ambergris is. And I do not want to yes. overlap with what they did. It's very interesting. Well, it's it's interesting that you pronounce it amber, and I'm not sure if it should be pronounced ambergris or ambergris, but that's I don't know <laughs> an interesting point about its origin? The, the origin of the word because. Originally, as I say, the word amber referred to both of these things. Okay. And so this was an, an attempt to distinguish the two types. One was amber gris, right. gray amber, right. and amber jaune, yellow, yellow amber, amber. Which right? is the resin. Which right. is the resin. Yeah. But for some time, there was a folk etymology because they were uncertain. Be, they became uncertain where this term ambergris or ambergris mm -hmm. came from. Mm -hmm. That uh, the folk etymology was that it was amber grease from Greece or amber greasy material. Oh, okay. So either from Greece, the country, or either Greece, Greece, the country, or Greece like fat. Gre Greece like fat. Yes, which it is a sort of fatty, greasy material. Right. So I'm not sure, based on that etymology, how one would assume it's pronounced. But I have um, no idea. Mm -hmm. I know I, I don't know why I'm pronouncing it the way I am, if that's how I heard it pronounced or if I just made it up in my head, because it's G-R-I-S. G-R-I-S, yeah. yeah. There is a million words in the lexicon of English that I have only <laughs> read and or heard maybe once or twice, and I pronounce them in a completely context-free way. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sure I get lots of stuff wrong. So here's one, another one that you'll no doubt know about is canary. Right. Yellow. That's named canary, after the bird. Right? Named after the bird. But of course, the bird is named after, after the, the island, which is named after dog, Canis, mm. mm -hmm. because there were dogs there. <laughs> so an island of dogs becomes, becomes a eventually type a type of color. bird, mm -hmm. which becomes a type of color. Yes. Now, another interesting one, and this is this is the pitfall that you run into when you're a medievalist, because something sounds natural to you and you think, oh, that's surely everyone knows this word this way. And then you realize, no, you're thinking in medieval <laughs> English <laughs> and no modern English speaker thinks that way. <laughs> mm -hmm. This is a problem that medievalists have. Fallow. There are two words, fallow. And in my mind, both are current. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I know the word fallow meaning a type of field that is not being not used being currently. Used. Yes. And I've come to realize that that is the only <laughs> modern sense of fallow. Um, is there a fallow deer? There is a fallow deer. And is that's that the, the color other word. context? That's okay. Because I know that term, like I know that phrase, fallow yes. deer. And that is the extent of my knowledge of it. Yes. But now that you say that, and in this context, I assume that's because it's a type of deer with a certain color. So there is a color word in Old English, fallow, that means sort of pale yellowish color. Right. It comes from an Indo-European root, pell, which means pale, and, and obviously gives us, gives us the word pale. Obviously. I've given up on obviously when it comes to etymologies <laughs> now. <laughs> I mean, obviously, black gives us white like or whatever, Western. right? Like, <laughs> I don't know anymore. And a bunch of other related ones like right. pallor right. and pallid, pallid yeah. and appalled. So to, to go pale, pale, to become yeah. pale. And interestingly, falcon. Oh, yeah. I guess it's a pale Colored feathered bird. bird. I don't know. <laughs> so I'm assuming this Old English word fallow doesn't really survive in modern no, English, I mean, even aside my... from things like, as you say, fallow deer. Well, yeah, but I don't think that's a modern term either. No, I think I know not. fallow deer from mm -hmm. like old translations of classic texts and things. I don't think it's a modern term either. Right. Remember, I am not a good control group for knowing <laughs> what is modern usage. <laughs> I have my own problems. I'm better at English spelling, but I'm not better at English, English usage. English, yes. <laughs> yes. I just find it so weird because in my mind, it's so associated with the color, the word fallow. And uh, this no. probably comes from reading way too much old English and not nearly yes. enough modern <laughs> Another interesting word from that root, by the way, the mm -hmm. Pell root, is polio, which is oh, an yeah. abbreviation of polio miletus mm -hmm. is the full technical word. And it comes from, well, through Latin, but from Greek, obviously, polios gray. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. And... Muelos marrow, so gray marrow. It's a disease of the uh, of the bones of the bones, I guess. Inflammation of the gray matter of the spinal cord. Right. 
Now, you mentioned crocus, and I'm glad you did, <laughs> because th this is an interesting thing. There is, I mean, the word crocus, obviously in English, the flower. Mm -hmm. Which is the Greek word crocus. The Greek word yeah. crocus, and it is the source of the, the saffron mm -hmm. spice. Obviously comes directly from, well, through Latin from, from, Greek. from the yeah. Greek. And it's a sort of learned borrowing in probably the, the 16th century, I think. I can't remember exactly when it was borrowed, but it's a later borrowing. The flower itself has been... May a, not have been a, cultivated. Particularly cultivated in England until later. You know? However, the interesting thing is there is an old English word, krog or kroch, Mm -hmm. which seems to be referring to saffron. So maybe saffron was imported long before the flower turned before out. Before the flower turned that out. That would make sense. That would make sense, yeah. importing mm -hmm. the flower or importing mm -hmm. or growing the flower would be much harder than importing the dried spice. Mm -hmm. And because it was a dye, it would have been a dye and a, and a medicinal and gastronomical luxury. Mm -hmm. It would have definitely been the sort of thing that was traded. But... The word croch or krog mm -hmm. is not directly related to the modern English word crocus. It's not where so we it get was crocus re, from. It was right. reborrowed from Latin. Right. The interesting thing is that the, I mean, the old English word croch, referring to the saffron color. Well, you you mentioned the word luteus or luteum, yeah. so it it glosses luteum. Okay. Well, as I said, luteum or lutum is a plant that gives us a yellow dye. A yellow dye. It's, okay. And I suspect, just from the fact that that's all that's given in the dictionaries. We don't know which plant. <laughs> right. But not probably saffron. It may gloss that in English because what would they know of the different dyes? But I think they were different right. things. Just because luteum and crocaeus are not used interchangeably. Well, there's a compound word of krog, yellow krog, yellow, <laughs> yellow krog. Okay. Which is not a very common word at all. And it seems to be used only in a gloss, glossing Latin, fulvus rubeus. Yellow, yellow, red. red. So orange. Okay. In other words, so it's a term Spoiler. for orange. We're not onto yes, orange on, yet. <laughs> not onto orange yet, but I yeah. want to mention it with with this krog. No, that just makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So. The right. word and for so orange. in this case, early the word for orange krog for that color. clearly then the the saffron color is is in the orange to reddish end of this and, color spectrum. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, I wanted to talk a little bit about one. So, I mean, in terms of, of yellow words, that sort of covers the main ones. There are other, you know, more obscure ones that refer to specific shades of yellow. In reference, in to, reference material to a things. material yeah. thing. Yeah. But I wanted to talk instead about the word yellow as an expression. Mm -hmm. And specifically the expression yellow journalism. I'm going to backtrack to some yellow connotations in medieval and Renaissance times, but I wanted to start with the word yellow itself Okay. Uh, and this term yellow journalism. Do you know where it comes from? Well, first of all, what does it mean? I think of yellow journalism as meaning sensationalist and probably sketchy yes. reporting on crime and, you know, the kind of sorts salacious of things. Salacious. Salacious stuff. Yeah. Type stuff. Yeah. 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 And do you have any notion of where it comes from? No. In my head, it's associated with yellowing newspaper pages, but I don't think that's what it is. <laughs> that's not far off, actually. It actually comes from early color printing and the use of mm. color separation and printing, actually printing in yellow, yellow oh, okay. color. And it specifically refers to one of the first comic strips, Sunday supplement mm. comic strips, which is okay. why sometimes the full term is yellow kid journalism. I don't know oh, if you've heard it Oh, I don't know. I've never form, heard that, no. Which refers to a specific comic strip which featured a character called the Yellow Kid. And he was a sort of slum neighborhood kid right. who always wore this oversized yellow shirt. Okay. And he was this sort of very positive, happy, happy-go-lucky kid who okay. appears in this comic strip. The interesting thing is that there were two newspapers in New York that printed this strip mm -hmm. at the same time. And they were in this bitter sort of publication battle, ratings battle with each other, trying to right. outsell each other. Both New York papers. One was the New York World and the other was the New York Journal. And in addition to publishing this Yellow Kid mm -hmm. comic strip, they also both descended to ye what we now refer to as yellow right. journalism. And so that's how the term kind of got associated with it. Okay. Interestingly, the New York World was published by Joseph Pulitzer. <laughs> after, after whom, whom the prize Pulitzer, is presumably Which named. I find really ironic that right. one of the people who invented yellow journalism is now considered the highest prize the pinnacle, in the pinnacle yeah. of journalism. That is interesting. Yeah. 
<laughs> and so it, we therefore owe it to color printing technology and the use of right. early color printing. But to sort of backtrack to sort of medieval and Renaissance and even earlier color associations mm-hmm. with, with the color yellow, let's go right back to biblical. Mm-hmm. Though it's not specifically mentioned anywhere in the text of the Bible, the color yellow becomes associated with Judas. That's a medieval association, really, not yeah. a biblical one. But. Not really. Well... Yeah, not really. It's not in the text, as, mm-hmm. as far as I know, of the, of the Bible. Mm-hmm. So it's comes. It's the way it's represented in medieval painting. iconography. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So with traitors. With traitors, and with I mean, now we think of yellow as being cowardly, cowardly. right? Mm-hmm. But early sort of associations were more with envy and jealousy, right? Probably coming from the the Judas mm-hmm. association. And so yellow in the Middle Ages and Renaissance becomes the color of exclusion. Right, hence the color of Judaism. The Judaism. So specifically, mm-hmm. the Jews in, I think it's Venice, were required to wear a yellow circle patch mm-hmm. to mark them out as being Jewish. Yeah. And this was revived, obviously, by the Nazis mm-hmm. during World War II era. Well, the, and if it was associated with David. jealousy and Judas, it was probably also associated with avarice. Yes. And avarice. that would be then associated with Judaism. And right? yellow. So yellow also people. becomes, yeah. in the same range of things, mm-hmm. associated as a color of money lending. Yeah, and that's why I'm thinking of, of it being associated with Jews, because they were money lenders and a lot of being restricted, <laughs> mostly because they weren't allowed to do anything else like mm-hmm. own land. Yeah. But, <laughs> but yeah, so. And so this, this sort of connects to this year's Christmas video. Right. The, right. Uh, the gold balls of the, the gold pawn balls brokers. of pawnbrokers. Mm-hmm. It becomes that that color becomes associated. Well, yes, because yellow, of course, lenders. is associated with gold. With gold, so yeah, it's yeah. an obvious association. Yeah. And so, unsu- perhaps unsurprisingly, yellow also is during the Middle Ages and Renaissance a color of prostitutes. Mm. They were, in fact, often required by law to wear yellow dresses. Right, because they too are. Shun. Outcast. Outcast. Yeah. 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 So you can tell in, in medieval depictions, right. the, yellow, the color so yellow So is Mary means... Magdalene de- depicted in yellow? Oh, that's like an that. interesting question. I'm not sure. I don't know. If anyone is an art historian who's listening or knows about that tradition, I would be interested to know if yellow is one of the colors of Mary, Mary Magdalene. Magdalene. Yeah. Interestingly, in medieval color associations, yellow, when combined with white, is considered Easter colors. Now it's yellow and purple, I guess. Yes. But in medieval and Renaissance associations, yellow and white. Well, white for the purity of Christ, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. And eggs. Yeah. But of course, now our main association with the color yellow is cowardliness. And this is a very recent association. And where does it come from? Well... That's a bit of a question. I mean, the earliest reference to this association dates only to 1924. That's really recent. Really recent. It seems to be a cowboy thing. Well, I mean, that's Yellow certainly belly. where yeah, that's certainly where you hear it yeah. used the yeah. most. Yeah. And uh, it could just be a sort of semi-rhyming duplication, yellow belly. So just for the assonance of it. But it might also be a reference to, and in which case it would go back further and just not be recorded, a Texas term for Mexican soldiers based on the color of their uniforms or based on a racial slur. Right. I would believe either of those. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it's not very easily traceable as far as I know. And almost certainly then doesn't probably go back to earlier associations. No. Probably a a North American context. A North American context only. And so, you know, yellow, the earlier associations are, as I I said, greed or envy. Right. Right. Which we now associate with green, interestingly. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's what I have on yellow. Okay. Well, let's double back to orange, which in the classical sense is not very far off because really... As I said, there's not that many words for these colors anyway, and they really overlap. I don't actually have any other words for orange because, (laughs) as I'm sure we will come to when you talk about it, there isn't really a separate chromatic category for orange. Unless we consider fulvous orange orange rather than yellow. Except it's really brown, as far as I can tell. Deep yellow, <laughs> reddish yellow, yeah. Gold well, this is but, colored, but that's tawny, the point, right? I, I mean, it can yeah. it can it can cover a whole range, a of, range colors, of colors, yeah. none of which is distinctly orange, mm-hmm. and certainly not the bright orange that we associate with orange now. Mm-hmm. You know, an orange is a color that is not fulvous. Mm-hmm. So the only word that I would say 
the crocaeus may well cover something that we would call orange. Yeah. So that's possible. But there is one item of clothing, actually, in the Roman world that probably comes as close as we're going to get to orange. It overlaps with yellow. So I said there was no real major symbolism of yellow, but you could argue with me and say, no, this is the symbolism. I'm calling it orange, but it's orange or yellow. So the flammeum. Now a flammeum is a veil that is flame covered. Sorry, flame colored. A flame covered veil would be very different and Ouch. really bad. <laughs> the flammeum is a flame colored veil worn by a Roman bride at her wedding. And that is the major association of the yellow orange color for a Roman is marriage. Hmm. What the bride wears. Now, flammeum is not an interesting word. It just means flame colored. So what color is flame? flame? Well, yeah. Okay. That's why I say I think orange is not a bad term for that. Sure. But, you know, red, yellow, it clearly is parts of those spectrums. And it was probably saffron dyed because the other term that's used for it in referencing it is crocaeus. Right. So the way they, it was flame colored, but the way they got that color was with saffron. And what I wanted to do was give you an example of this particular association from some Roman poetry. I think it's a poem that shows the connections between yellow and orange and marriage nicely. And in mm. fact, gold as well. So it's a poem by Catullus. It's an epithalamium. That is, it's a poem written to celebrate a marriage. And it's poem 61 in his corpus. I'll put a link in the show notes. And it's a hymn to Hymen. Hymen is the god of weddings. Mm -hmm. Hymen, Hymenaeus. And so I'm going to read a couple of passages. It moves through, really, the whole poem moves through the whole wedding process. In the Roman world, weddings occurred at night. And what happened was a procession would go to the bride's house. The bride would come out. There would be a procession from her house to the groom's house where the marriage would occur and they would go into the house and then go into the bedchamber and the marriage would, would be finalized. <laughs> <laughs> Nicely put. And it was public and the procession was public. And that was really important because the whole point of a marriage was to publicly make hmm. the connection between two families. So a marriage procession in Rome also was accompanied therefore by torchlight. And that's important. And we'll come back to that. Mm. So torches, in fact, become metonymically representative of marriage. Right. So okay. the, the torches means marriage. Right. Because that's what a wedding has is torches. And also because of the association between love and the burning passion. So the metaphor of flames is used often for love and for sexual attraction. So the idea of wedding torches and flame are then connected to mm. sexual passion. So the Catullus poem opens with an address to Hymen, the god of marriage, saying, come, come be present, come be present at this marriage. So when he addresses Hymen, he says, put on the flame red veil and come and visit us joyfully, white feet shod with yellow shoes, great god. And the words in Latin are flammeum, cape the flammeum, put on the flammeum. Mm -hmm. Come here, gerens niveo pede, on your snow white foot. Mm -hmm a luteum socum, a yellow shoe. So Hymen is dressed like a bride. He's dressed in the flammeum mm -hmm. and he's dressed in a yellow shoe. So here we see the association between that flammeum color and yellow. Mm -hmm. So yellow is in fact, I said it didn't have associations, but really it is the color of marriage. And yellow shoes, luteum by the way, is also the word that's often used to describe egg yolks. Okay. So if you, you know, if you want to know what color it is, it's the color mm -hmm. of egg yolks. So he's wearing the flammeum and he's wearing yellow shoes. And when later on, when the poet addresses the bride, urging her to come out to join the procession, much of the underlying point of this poem is how reluctant the bride is to get married. Huh. And then also how reluctant the groom is to get married because he has to give up his boys. <laughs> this is part of, there's a whole tradition in Roman marriage ceremonies of teasing the groom in particular, but both the bride and the groom mm -hmm. with a various sort of sexually charged jokes. That's okay. part of the mm. procession. So he says to the bride, look how the torches shake their locks of fiery gold. So he's saying, come out to the procession. Look, the torches are ready. Hmm. And the, but the torches have aureas comas, golden hair. 
But so here we see he's repeating these colors mm. because mm -hmm. these are the colors associated with. She has, after all, a flame colored veil on. Right. So the torches, but the torches are golden colored. Mm. So if we want to sort of see what the relationship between gold is and yellow and orange and red, right. we can see that the torches are golden. Right. And I mean, is fire golden? It depends what color you think, gold, you think is, gold is, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then a little later, he talks to the bride of, of, as she enters the new home, her new home, which is the groom's home. So she's done the procession from mm, her father's mm. home. Now she's come to her new home. And I thought this was, read this just because it is a part of even today's wedding ceremonies. Step high then for good luck on feet slippered with gold in through the polished door over the new threshold. So she has to raise her aureolos pedes, her little golden feet. So her feet are not golden, but the shoes are golden. And remember, mm. Hyman was wearing yellow shoes because he was dressed right. like a bride. So her shoes are golden. So while she's wearing a flame colored veil, which is the mm -hmm. sign that she's a bride, there's clearly a general association with gold and yellow right. for weddings. But I thought I'd mention that because that's the idea that you have to be very careful stepping over the threshold the very first time you enter the home as a new bride. Ah. Because if you trip on the threshold, that's a very bad omen. <laughs> very, very, very bad omen. Which is why often, in fact, the groom would carry, carry. the bride right. over okay. the threshold so that she couldn't possibly trip. And that's still today, when a groom carries a bride mm. over the threshold, that's what he's doing. He's... Now, what if the groom sort of trips? I mean... I mean, that's really bad. <laughs> the, the Roman groom is wearing a toga, I guess. Yeah, I it's that true. can't be easy to walk around in <laughs> either. True. They don't. They don't discuss that. <laughs> <laughs> Here she's just lifting her own foot, her own little foot. Right. And then in a passage that I think is really interesting, he then addresses the bridegroom as he's about to enter the bedchamber. So they come to the home and then the girl is prepared by her mother and her bridesmaids mm. for bed. Mm. And she goes into the bedchamber and she gets ready. And then the bridegroom is told, now it's your job to go in there. Mm. And he says uh, to the bridegroom, the bridal bower is ready. Your wife waits. And this is the translation I have. Her face raised like a flower poppy flushed, daisy white, and radiantly bright. And if you remember back to the red and white episodes, mm. I talked about this contrast of red and white and how that's a sexually right. charged right. contrast and very attractive. So that's totally understandable, right? Except that's not what's in the Latin exactly, because the Latin is one of these passages that's impossible to translate huh. because it will just sound so weird to modern ears. So it says the uxor in talamo tibies, the your wife is in your in your bedchamber, fine. Ore floridulo nitens, shining with her flower-like face. Alba parthenike velut, like a white parthenicus. And the only translation the dictionary has is a flower. So it's a flower, Parthenicus. But Parthenicus, Parthenicus is, or Parth Parthenos is um, virgin in Greek. Hmm. So it's a flower, but with, it's with some flower of, with association of virginity. Mm. So obviously that makes sense. You know, right. if you're going to describe True. the bride on her wedding night, she's going to be Parthenicus. But it's white. So some sort of flower and white. Okay, fine. Her face raised like a flower, white. And we know that white is attractive in certain contexts. Luteum we papa were. Or, so she's like a white Parthenicus, or like a luteum papa ver. Papa ver is poppy. Luteum is yellow, or like a yellow poppy. Hmm. Now, first of all, poppies aren't yellow. I mean, there are yellow poppies now. I don't know if there were yellow poppies then. Poppies are very distinctly red, red yeah. in ancient thought. Is there some variety of poppies that might Maybe, have been? Maybe, but I wonder if we have here a problem of chromatic separation. Mm. What counts as red and what counts as yellow? Right, okay. Right? So if it's orangey, and if really what we're looking... Why would he use the word luteum? Mm. Well, because what color is a bride? A right. bride is yellow, not because she's yellow, not because her face is yellow, but because she's a bride is yellow. Symbolically That's yellow. symbolically yeah. the color that is associated with the, the mm. bride. So while our translation said her face raised like a flower, poppy flushed, daisy white, and, uh, and radiantly bright, 
he's trying to get all of these and like I cutting the translator lots of slack here because mm-hmm. you can't mm-hmm. say her face was poppy yellow. Right. Like <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. Mm-hmm. Um, but he's using that. And so I think what we see here is that overlapping. There isn't a color. I mean, there is a color yellow, but it doesn't need to mean yellow. Mm. She's raising her face to him. But we're not to think that it's bright yellow, that like color. an egg yolk. Yes. <laughs> like if her face was the color of an egg yolk, there'd be problems. <laughs> she's white because she's beautiful and virgin- virginical. <laughs> Virginal, perhaps? It's possible that the second cocktail is getting to me. <laughs> um, she's white because she's beautiful and because she's a virgin and possibly because she's frightened, which is part of the role of the bride in these mm. things. Unpleasant as that thought is. But she's luteum because she's a bride, bride and right. brides wear yellow and are associated with yellow. So I just think that's really telling. And having read those different passages, you can see that complex of how he comes back to those colors again and again. He's pulling those colors out wherever he can because those are the colors that are thematically appropriate to a wedding. Right. Rather than because those are specific chromatic descriptions of the hue of everybody involved. And I think that that's really important when we're looking at classical uses of color, that those thematic elements are as important or more important than the particular colors they connote Hmm. or they denote. Okay, so that's really all I have to say about orange, because as I say, there really isn't a color that is distinctively orange in the ancient world. No. And that's not surprising because it's one of these later color terms, generally Mm -hmm. speaking. Very late. Very late. Orange is probably, I mean, the word orange is probably one of the most interesting words in the English language. Aside from the fact that you will probably all know the uh, the standard saying that nothing rhymes with orange. <laughs> the word orange itself first occurs in English only in 1512. Right. Very late. Very late. Now, I'm going to try and tell the the history of the word orange and where it comes from and how we get it. But I will preface this by saying that really you should be listening to Ben Zimmer tell us about the history of the word orange. Yeah. On the podcast Lexicon Valley, we will link to the episode in the show notes. It's a very long and convoluted story and he does a really good job of yeah. telling it. And there's also a blog post, we'll link to that as well, where he goes into it in some more depth and, and retells the story. So yeah, give us the very brief outlines of it. Yes. So the word orange comes from probably uh, ultimately a Dravidian root. So like Tamil, you know, Mm -hmm. that family language, South Indian language. There is a word naru, which means fragrant. Okay, so it would be referring to the orange blossoms and maybe the orange blossom. So I should preface all this by saying that the word orange originally refers to the fruit, not the color. Yes. Yeah, and that, I mean, that is part of the point of, yeah. of the... Yeah, and so the orange color word is colored like the fruit. Yeah. So it originally probably comes from this Dravidian root, meaning fragrant. It comes through Persian, Arabic, then into Spain. Right. Through Arabic, and from Spain into France. And by an incredible coincidence, so the, the, the word is naranga in Sanskrit. Right. And by quite a coincidence, when it comes into European languages, first mm-hmm. of all, the, there's this thing called rebracketing that happens. An a naranga becomes an aranga, right. basically. A norange becomes an orange. Yes. So a process that happens with a number. A of number other of other words. words. Yeah. So apron is another example. Apron was originally napron. A napron becomes an apron. And a. Uh, Natter becomes an, an adder. adder. Yes. yes. Those so are the two ones I've this heard This is called before. rebracketing where the, the word division, word gets, division changed. gets changed. Yeah. And by incredible coincidence, <laughs> the word as it reaches France is remarkably similar to the name of a town in France. What that is comes it? from no, no related. No related. Yeah. yeah. In fact, uh, so that, that town in Latin, the Latin version of the name is Arausio which it originally comes not from Latin, but from a Celtic source. It refers to a Celtic god. Right. And so by incredible chance, the two words are remarkably similar. Mm -hmm. And so they fall together. Right. And so that town we now know as Orange in France Mm -hmm. still exists. Now here's where it gets so. (laughs) I know now it gets complicated. It gets twisty turny. Listen to the other podcast. (laughs) 
So what happens is a particular family, Philibert of Orange, the town, the town in France, basically gains control over the Netherlands. Right. And it gets passed down since he doesn't have a direct heir. He doesn't have a son. Mm -hmm. Gets passed down to his nephew, William of Nassau, who then founded the Dutch Republic and therefore the House of Or the House of Orange, mm -hmm. the royal family of. It's very the weird Dutch. to found a republic with a royal house, but anyway, yes. we'll move on <laughs> quickly past strange Dutch history. Well, William basically sides with the Dutch Protestants against Spain. Mm -hmm. So, if you remember the Christmas video I talked about, <laughs> right? Yes, connections between the Netherlands Spanish. being under the control of Spain at this time, hence the Saint Nicholas. It's almost Story. like there are connections, between, connections all sorts between everything. Of things. It's ah. all connected. Go on. <laughs> so therefore, this House of Orange takes up the color orange because of the similarity in the between name. Between the name of the town and the name they of the color. They take it up as a symbolic color of the family, the royal house, and that becomes the color of Protestant. That becomes the color of Protestantism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, Protestantism even in Well, first of all, Ireland, in, of, of the Netherlands. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, to this day, if you watch uh, World the Cup. Dutch team yeah. in, in the World Cup, they're wearing orange. Yeah, or, or uh, speed skating. Is or speed skating or whatever. Yeah. Yes. So that's but the national color. But then it becomes Protestantism it becomes like Protestantism. in Ireland, where orange men are the Protestants. Protestant. And the way that happens is, of course, the great-grandson of <laughs> William... William the third. This is the real reason for getting mo rid of monarchies is because you have to know so much genealogy to deal with monarchies. It's just crazy. No, wait, the grandson, not the great grandson, just the grandson. Mm -hmm. William the third, William of Orange, mm -hmm. marries the British Mary. William and Mary, right? William and Mary, the Protestants who oppress the Catholics. Who oppress? So before <laughs> before William the Third was Charles the Second, right? Who had Catholicish leanings, or what? That was the worry. Yeah. And so they desperately wanted a Protestant, a clear Protestant, on the throne. Hence William and Mary. Hence William and Mary. And so this is called the, the Glorious Revolution. Yes, yes. The deposing of the, the monarch in favor of a clearly Protestant monarch. William and Mary ruled together until her death. And then William ruled in his own right. Mm -hmm. And that's where the Protestantism gets associated with orangeness. With orangeness. And in Ireland in particular. And then in Ireland in particular. Yeah. persecuting the Catholics. Yeah. yeah. Now... Here's one crazy story <laughs> about all of this, is that carrots, we now think of as an orange vegetable. Mm -hmm. Probably the most notably. The clearly the most orange. orange of vegetables. <laughs> yes. Did not used to be orange. Mm -hmm. They used to be either yellow or purple or other colors. Mm -hmm. Not orange. So there is a story, possibly apocryphal, I'm not going to stake anything on this, the veracity of the story, but there is a story that the orange carrot was specifically bred by a patriotic Dutchman mm -hmm. to be orange in honor of the House of Orange. And while it's possible, you know, one can see why that might be apocryphal, the Dutch are well known for their horticultural prowess. Indeed. And for breeding very, sp I mean, the, you know, everyone knows them for the tulips but they were just in general very good at that kind of breeding and it is possible that even if it wasn't done on purpose that is why it was popularized is because the orange had a political association yes but now carrots are just orange though they're reintroducing fancy gourmet carrots yes. in the other colors heirloom, in the other colors. Yeah. heirloom yeah. carrots or whatever they call them uh, yeah in mm -hmm. other colors mm -hmm. So that is my r very rough rundown of the history of the word orange. But as I say, for the full details, mm -hmm. do listen to Ben Zimmer. It uh, is really do a much better job of it than I do. Well, it's just a lot to say. There's and a lot I mean, to say. Yeah, it's could, a complicated could, story. Yeah. Which, of course, raises the question, what did they call the color orange in English before the word orange? Mm -hmm. And there is an old English term, yellow red, in old English, yellow red. <laughs> Literally, I do yellow, like red. the Anglo Saxons. Yes. They're very literal. So that's the old term for mm -hmm. for orange. Um, well, uh, to be honest, it's interesting that they even had a term. Yes, because as I just pointed out, the Romans didn't, mm -hmm. and the Greeks didn't. Mm -hmm. 
they didn't have a term for orange. It just was a version of red or yellow. Right. Or reddish yellow. I mean, I'm sure if a painter really wanted to describe it, he could probably have combined the words yellow mm -hmm. and red. I'm mm -hmm. sure that's a thing he could have done, but there was no term. Mm -hmm. So the distinguishing of orange as a separate, separate chromatic yeah. range mm -hmm. doesn't seem to have been common. Well, and, and in English, historically, I mean, I guess they thought of it as a sort of red. If you think of the idea of redhead mm -hmm. is really orange haired or yeah. Robin Redbreast yeah. is really orange, orange feathers, colored, yeah, yeah. orange colors. So well, that, certainly in the, yeah, certainly the red, the Robin in North America is orange. The Robin in Britain, Britain is a lot redder. The redder? Okay. Yeah. Then but still, no, sense. I agree entirely though. I mean, the, and red fox. Red, red deer. Fox. Yeah, yeah. I mean, all of those those animals mm -hmm. are not red. Mm -hmm. They're really orange. orange. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree. That being said, as I you know, as I say, there are terms in Old English that seem to cover orange, like mm -hmm. yellow red, or as I mentioned before, crog mm -hmm. from the crocus color. Mm -hmm. So it's a sort of yellowy, orangey, orangey color. red something, and more specifically, yellow crog. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yellow. Yeah, Crocus. so they were they were making that distinction more that. than some people might have been. Yeah. Yeah. Even to this day, there aren't really many other colors that refer, or other terms to refer to the color orange that don't refer to a thing, right? Yeah, yeah. So we have ginger, mm -hmm. another Though, term for redhead. Which oddly, I mean, that's one of the weirder ones. It's quite because, yellow. Well, ginger you, itself, yeah. Is yellow. I mean, color. the root is the sort root of is yellowish. Pale. Pale. And the dried powder is yellow there's nothing about ginger that's actually the color orange. of what a person who is ginger ginger is. yeah so yeah. it's an odd one but saffron mm -hmm. is used as a color mm -hmm. term and to refer yet again to the christmas episode tangerine right right is a color term right so a specific type of orange mm -hmm. and of course the clear color terminology cheeto cheeto yes <laughs> so i don't <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to bring us to the Well, and to bring us back to that, I don't have a lot of specific color associations with, no. with orange because orange wasn't a color until Very the, recently, the early yeah. modern period. So there aren't medieval connotations. connotations. Well, it's but interesting. we have modern ones. <laughs> well, it's interesting to say, you know, that orange comes about and becomes, I mean, I think one of the reasons that orange solidifies into a primary color term is that political association, yeah. political and religious mm -hmm. association. And right now there is a new political meaning to the to term, term orange. orange. Yeah. And it is referring to a current elected politician. Cheeto president. You know, I mean, obviously that's an insult, but it is developing a political meaning. I don't know how long it will last. It will depend on lots of things, but it, it it is developing a new political meaning. So while orange has been associated with Protestantism and the Netherlands and things, yeah. it's pulling out a new yep. meaning. Well, and iconographically speaking, mm -hmm. I mean, as satirical political mm -hmm. cartooning is... Is definitely know, is, something is that major affects... Thing. Yeah, absolutely affects the way these things work. Yeah, And so it will presumably be fair game to Mm -hmm. political cartoonists which may well make a real impact on the way the language works yeah and so as long as there is the figure to refer to it will be drawn on presumably mm -hmm. <laughs> literally <laughs> and i will reference the fact that orange like yellow is a color of jealousy i think that's kind of interesting given its new political the idea of envy and <laughs> envy jealousy and, yes we referenced this a little bit, I think, when we were talking about green, but there is that particular reference in uh, Much Ado About Nothing to the color Seville, ah. right? In in which Beatrice says of someone, of um, Claudio, that he is civil, civil count, and something of that jealous complexion. And it's a pun on Seville oranges. Seville oranges, right. And it's the idea is that he is orange, which means he is jealous because in the very complicated play at the time, he thinks someone else has been moving in on his girl. So right. he's jealous. Right. And so the, the pun there is that he is orange mm -hmm. and therefore jealous, which, as you said, comes from the association of and yellow, yellow with, with, with jealousy. jealousy. And, and since orange yeah. is really just a form of yellow, yellow. Mm -hmm. it seems to have been mm -hmm. connected to it. But I think that's interesting, given the current political situation and the sort of psychology of the orange men today. It's been it's just been interesting to see orange used as an epithet. Yes. Yeah. In a way that is 
you know, separate Mm -hmm. from. And I think it is partly the fact that it is a new word and therefore you can tell we're classicists and medievalists when I say a new word because it's from the 17th century. But (laughs) it doesn't have strong racial associations, for instance. True. So it can be thrown around Mm -hmm. as an insult without having other connotations. Yeah. You couldn't call them yellow. Yellow, because, right? you know, that's like the, the World War Two era yellow peril. Well, or more than that. I mean, yellow has been or a term has used been a term uh, since, since, since the 19th, since the 19th century, century yeah, at least. Absolutely yeah, absolutely has been a racially offensive term. And, you know, there's other mm-hmm. terms you can't you can't use. But orange is fair game because orange doesn't mean anything. It doesn't right. mean anyone. Yeah, it yeah. doesn't, you know, it doesn't refer to any group. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, of course it's insulting and therefore you can, it's personally insulting about his appearance, which you can argue about whether or not that's a good thing. But the point is it's, it's, it doesn't have any other connotations. Mm-hmm. And the connotations of jealousy and other medievalist connotations are not ones that anyone today really knows. No. Yeah. So it's, it's mm-hmm. fairly context free. Mm-hmm. So it's it's fair game in a way that other terms wouldn't be. It's interesting that it's often associated with, again, a thing like Cheeto is the, mm-hmm. the, it's the of other standard. term. Yeah. OK, I have finished both of my drinks. You haven't finished yours. True. Have you actually talked more than me this time? That would be astounding. But I think we really should call it quits on orange and yellow. So we have a couple of colors left to cover. It'll be a little while probably because before we come back to them. There's brown and gray and purple. I keep saying We're I'm going to come to purple. We're going to save it to the end. We have to save it to the end, you realize, because people will stop listening once purple comes up. <laughs> and pink and uh, yeah, a few other things. But uh, we're coming close to the end of, of covering our colors. But let us know if you have any thoughts about anything we've missed, any particular connotations of yellow or orange that we haven't we didn't talk about racial connections, for instance, of no. yellow. And, of course, we didn't talk about non-Eurocentric color associations. Yes. For instance, yellow is very important. It's one of the four colors in indigenous uh, Native American beliefs and descriptions of the world, the four corners mm. of the world, the four directions, mm-hmm. yellow, black, red, and white, I think. And I think yellow has particular spiritual associations in Eastern cultures. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. So we definitely on a lot of yellow aspects, and it would be interesting to know actually about how the terminology in those cultures differs in terms of how distinct the yellow color is, because I would imagine if it has a lot more resonance for a culture, it has a more distinct color mm. terminology. You know, Rome doesn't have very good terminology for yellow because yellow isn't very important to it as a distinct color symbolically. Mm -hmm. But if it's more important in some cultures, it probably has better terminology. Anyway, so if you have any thoughts on that, do let us know and we'll try to follow up on that the next time we revisit colors. And of course, we never talked about bananas. Yes, we have no bananas. We have no bananas today. (laughs) Can we end on that? (laughs) For more information on this podcast, check out the website www.alliterative.net, where you can find links to the videos, blog posts, sources, and credits. We've also got all the ways you can follow us, Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, G+, a mailing list, and Instagram. And please check out our Patreon, where you can pledge to support this show and our video project. You can go directly to the videos at youtube.com slash alliterative. Our email is on the website, but the easiest way to get in touch with us is on Twitter. I'm at Avensara, A-V-E-N-S-A-R-A-H. And I'm at Alliterative. To keep up with the podcast, subscribe on iTunes or to the feed on the website. And please review it on iTunes if you can and if you've enjoyed it. It helps us a lot. We'll be back soon with more musings about the connections around us. Thanks for listening. Bye. Hello, Kat. No, 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 don't step. No, don't step on my computer. No, don't. Li- no, don't lick the ma- <laughs> microphone. <laughs> definitely going to sound weird online. <laughs> Esther, lie down. Leave my microphone alone. Lie down. Leave, leave my all- computer alone. No, not mine either. <laughs>